Welcome to Exhale, a podcast series where we explore topics in spirometry and respiratory care. Your hosts are Mark Russell, Marketing Communications Manager, and Jance Lanier, National Sales Manager and Respiratory Therapist for Vitalgraph US, a global leader in respiratory diagnostics. This year marks the 21st anniversary for Vitalgraph's clinical trial services. Mark and Jansen interview Lewis Weidman, former director of Vitalgraph Limited, where he had worked since 1991. He has responsibility for Vitalgraph's global business within the pharmaceutical industry, and in particular within the field of respiratory clinical trials. Well, welcome, Lewis, to our podcast. Well, thank you, Mark and Jansen. I understand you're all there too. Thank you for inviting me uh, for the podcast. It's a real pleasure to be able to talk with you about the Vitalograph clinical trials business that I started all those years ago, and I really can't believe it was 21 years ago. Yeah, that's amazing. Big mile marker for Vitalograph. So why don't you just give us a little bit about your background on yourself, education, experience, and what are you doing today? Well, I'm retired today, and Who would have thought that I'd be almost as busy? Some people say busier than I was when I was working at Vitalograph. I retired. Yeah, it's uh, it's a busy time being retired with little grandchildren. So great. Yeah, it is. Um, So having retired in 2012, I then remained on the Vitalograph board as a non-exec for a further six years. And I'm now always very excited to learn the latest news on how the business is going and know how it has gone from strength to strength. And it's doing so well. It's wonderful. Great. So how did you get started working with a medical device company? When did you join Vitalgraph? Well, I joined in 1991. So that's 21 years ago. 21 years ago. Absolutely. Yeah, so, and I'd worked in product development in different industries, having a physics, maths, chartered engineering background. I worked in nuclear physics, I worked on laser radar, in the non-ferrous metals industry, gas metering, and all of these were development roles, but with very strong marketing interaction where I was always involved in developing products with customers' inputs. So that then led me to my first business role, which was in the electronic security industry, where I covered product marketing and global sales. And I had one claim to fame where I helped to win one of the first UK electronic tagging of prisoner trials in the UK, where there was film footage of my ankle on the six o'clock news sporting a very smart security anklet. So lots of development projects in different industries. And uh, Vitalograph was my first and only venture into the medical world. And for me, this customer base in the medical world had made all the difference. Doctors, pharmaceutical teams with integrity in the pursuit of excellence in healthcare. And what a wonderful industry I found myself in working. I started at Vitalograph in product management. I closely liaised with R&D and then also managed international sales. And our team was good at selling customized products to pharma sales departments. But we also had a growing success in providing equipment for pharmaceutical clinical trials, albeit to start with relatively small scale, but um, also here we would customize software. So that's how I got into Vitalograph after a long time in other industries. And then the clinical trials really started from there. So when you started with Vitalograph in the clinical trials, what type of studies were you uh, creating and forming with a lot of these different pharmaceutical companies? 
Well, to start with, we use standalone spirometry equipment. Okay. And we would sometimes customize that. We weren't really providing any services at that time other than training investigators on how to use the equipment. So because that was going so well, uh, I suggested that we should focus on developing this business for the pharmaceutical industry and in particular the clinical trials and the associated services. So the service side of the Vitalograph business in pharmaceutical studies developed from there. And to start with, I was the only person at Vitalograph with this 100% focus on the pharma industry. Well, good. We appreciate that. So given you started at the ground level with Vitalograph clinical trials, what type of advice for others on how to set up a new department? Right. Well, what we did was to recruit people with the right skill set and aptitude. Mm -hmm. So that, um, that's so important. For example, I recruited a very knowledgeable ex-pharma scientist and he taught us the fundamentals of pharma studies, the rules and regs, the operating procedures, and in particular, the importance of centralizing data, overreading the data, ensuring the study sites were performing spirometry correctly. So without his expertise, it would have been quite difficult in a much longer process. And because of his knowledge, it gave us credibility. So having the right people on board, in this case, a consultant, we also brought in consultant overreaders who are renowned experts in the respiratory field. And together we gave our customers confidence that they wanted in the services we were providing. So the first point then is getting the right people on board. Then I would say papers that referenced the use of our equipment and services in clinical trials. Sure. So that that is key to getting known and, and again to giving customers confidence that what we were doing was good. Uh, we presented those papers at international symposia, at international conferences, and we networked with many of the key opinion leaders in the field. So opinion leaders and um, corresponding with them very closely uh, was the second point and very important. The third point goes back to recruiting the right people, the young teams of scientists we put together in our project management team. And these people were of the right aptitude, uh, the right background. And in project management, they then liaise directly with the pharma personnel, training them and their investigators. So people again there. But above all else, the continued support of the Vitalograph board, the company board of directors, was critical to the success of the business. So board support is a no-brainer, goes without saying, and we got 100% support in what we did. The patience that you had to have in building the expertise within the company uh, and our reputation of our services. Remember, this was the first time we were providing such services within the industry. Recruiting the right people, I've said that. Um, developing these close relationships with customers and opinion leaders. And the ability to work closely with our own research and development teams and manufacturing in delivering custom and, and also standard products to time, specification, and cost. So I think those are the key things as well as having to be prepared to work 24 seven if you need to. Sure, so when these trials started up uh, with Vitalograph, did you start them in Europe first with, with partners there in the pharmaceutical industry or were they over here at the US? The, the first 
company where we won a contract with centralized spirometry. So our first really big important study was with a European pharmaceutical company. So that was, but it was a global study. Most studies are global, certainly phase three studies are. And this was a phase three study and it was global. I don't believe it was in the US, but it was in Asia and Europe predominantly, and I believe South Africa as well. Why don't you tell our audience, why is there first, second, third phase of different clinical trials? What is the importance of that? Wow. Uh, it's been a few years since I retired, Mark. But <laughs> if I, so if I remember correctly, the phase one relates to the safety of the study drug. Okay. Um, in healthy subjects, just to make sure that the drug is doing uh, what it should do, the mm. pharmacodynamics and kinetics. And so it's going to the right parts of the body and doing what it should do, and not doing what it shouldn't do. Sure. Phase two, then, is a step further. In it's the first time that subjects with the disease in question that the drug is tackling, that those subjects are recruited. And, and it would be of limited size usually. So fewer sites might be global. And then if that's successful and efficacy is proven statistically, then that would go on to a much larger phase three study, again, in subjects who are being studied with that particular disease. Sure. Great. So what changes have you seen in the respiratory uh, device industry since you've been working? I know you've been retired for a number of years, but when you first started, what new products developed out of a lot of these studies? Well, I think the key thing was how patients or subjects in clinical trials, as they're called, at home, we're starting to use electronic devices. No longer was there the same reliance on dubious handwritten paper records. So that was now being avoided. And products got smaller and smarter, were designed ergonomically, being linked by mobile phones or the phone networks, and latterly, pretty much. 100% of the time via the internet to our central database for direct transmission from patients' homes so that you could give them direct feedback and feedback to our customer, the pharmaceutical companies. So the result was good quality, fast data. Good. So question kind of turning it a little bit different is with the increased number of clinical trials that have been going on, whether it's COVID related or just industry related, it's put some pressure on manufacturers to get product to these clinical trials to get them started and active. So with the recent event in supply chain shutdowns, how important is manufacturing in Ireland for the UK and in Europe and then possibly in the US? How important is that? Well, it's really important because although I retired finally four years ago, I still read the news, the business news, and it's no news to most people how these recent effects have affected the sourcing of key components and raw materials for, in my telegraph's case, manufacturing electronic products, both the electronics and the plastic mouldings, pretty much everything to do with a medical device. So sourcing materials as locally as possible and manufacturing locally in Ireland is important. Labor costs are being driven higher all the time in the Far East, such as China, where so much of these components have been manufactured in the past. So they're not as competitive any longer. And then there's the increase, yeah. And then there's the increased cost of shipping from one side of the world to the other. 
plus the high environmental impact. And that all means now that Ireland has become economically competitive to do things themselves, not Absolutely. to mention, yeah. And then there's a huge management cost involved in working with those companies in distant countries. So the closer the company, the closer the control, and the more responsive that company can be to our needs, to our, you know, us as the customer's needs. Sure. Interesting. So let's talk about the Vitalijack. How much were you involved in the development of that product? Well, I remember that I met someone on a transatlantic flight to an international conference in USA, and he was very much involved in the very early days of researching these cough sounds and looking into that. So I got talking to him and then I bumped into him again in the lift going up to our hotel rooms. <laughs> um, and then our CEO and he got together and from that, everything developed. So in the early days, I was very much involved in it. Mm -hmm. But then our R&D director, who is now our CEO, he very much took it on board and drove it from that point onwards sure so i was involved a little to start with i was involved in conferences where it was being discussed but i really left it to the, those guys to develop and look at the huge success why don't you tell our audience what the vitalijack does because there might be a few people that don't know about that product and there wasn't anything else before that so this was very innovative for the industry, correct? Yeah, very much so, Mark. It, in, incredible. It's a recording device that subjects take home with them. It records 24-7 for a number of days, depending on how much memory it has inside of it. Um, I'm a little bit out of touch with everything that it currently does i know what we would all love it to do <laughs> uh, we'd love it to be able to analyze the coughs there and then and numerically count the coughs as they're being recorded but that sure. is that's pretty difficult so instead of that the data is transferred to vitalograph where we have experts a lot of experts who are there listening to the coughs. And a lot of extraneous noises are canceled out anyway, uh, filtered out, and they will then count the coughs. So th there's some manual work involved in this. Yes, and we use a validated algorithm that makes the recording a whole lot shorter by removing the non-cough sounds like speech and silence to make a manual counting viable and protects privacy. Into the future, maybe we'll have the algorithms that will completely count the coughs. But what we don't know is that in different diseases, in different age ranges of subjects, whether there need to be different algorithms. Because people don't cough the same way. They're, they're all different. Yeah, but in a particular illness, in a particular age group, we believe that maybe, well, I don't know. I'm a bit out of touch with this, but sure. the, thought, the thought was that maybe you could develop algorithms that could count coughs. That's yeah. fascinating. We're there. We're there. So now that you're retired and obviously you put in a good 21 years with uh, Vitalograph and building this amazing service that we now provide, do you have any regrets, anything that you would change or like to see for the future? I think one of the things I would have liked to have done, and um, that would have been to have built the business quicker. But when you have very complex studies that we're providing a lot of support for. What is more important is that we give our customers the best possible customer support. And we concentrated on that. And we 
uh, rather than developing the business too fast, I suppose, or faster. So we concentrated on customer support. Other than that, I do miss the working at my Telegraph, but I do enjoy retirement and I enjoy retirement more than working. <laughs> sure. uh, but, yeah, but I do love to keep in touch and to hear the successes that continue. Good. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were at a conference, uh, the ATA, the American Telehealth Association. Frank was there, our CEO, and I was shocked to hear that uh, we're up to 69 live clinical trials right now, that uh, it's just phenomenal, the growth and how far we've come with clinical trials. And that tells you that you have built a great foundation. And now that Vitalograph has continued the torch of good customer service and good outcomes for our clinical trials. Well, thank, thanks, Marf. Well, I, it was a very enjoyable, very hard working time for me at Vitalograph, and I would do it all over again. That's great. Well, Lewis, thank you for being on our podcast. This was a kind of a look back on how clinical trials started here by Telegraph since we have our 21st anniversary this year on clinical trials. And we appreciate you being on our, our program. Well, thank you for inviting me. And I look forward to hearing continued success at by Telegraph for many years to come. You have been listening to Exhale with Vitalograph. Your hosts are Mark Russell and Jance Lanier. We hope you enjoyed what you heard today. Please follow us for upcoming episodes. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to you joining us again on Exhale with Vitalograph.